knowledge uh, in uh, 60 years of ham radio i don't remember special awards for home brewing it hello i'm frank howell call sign k4 fmh or fox mike hotel I'm chair of the steering committee for the Homebrew Heroes Award program. Martin Butler, M1MRB, and Colin Butler, M6BOY, are two other members of our steering committee. Colin will join us in a few moments with his thoughts. Martin will be conducting our interview for the Homebrew 2020 recipient. Wow, it's really been a fast, fast year. It just seems like yesterday when Martin and Colin and I were having a sandwich on some bleachers at the Xenia Hamvention and we were talking about and marveling at all the homebrew work that was on display or for sale at Hamvention. I just mentioned in passing that there are some homebrew heroes here for sure. We suddenly looked at each other, all three smiling, and realized there needs to be some kind of recognition and lifting up to promote homebrew heroes in our midst and yet we could find no program. So from May until October of last year, the three of us launched the Homebrew Heroes Award program. I had no idea at the time that Bill Mira of Solder Smoke fame had actually coined the term Homebrew Heroes in his blog some years ago. Here's to you, Bill. Well, we've been amazed at the positive reception to this award. In fact, after the Hero 2019 announcement of Han Summers G0 UPL, we really stopped counting social media hits after they reached 10 million. In addition, we've had a number of prize donor sponsors come on board for both last year and this year. We're very pleased with that. But in addition, a fellow podcast host, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, of QSO Today and QSO Today Expo fame, has become a sponsor for this year as well. And we thank Eric for that endorsement and support. Now, the prizes donated by these sponsors directly and tangibly help uh, our heroes enhance their bench to produce even more amazing results for the amateur radio and maker hobby and commercial space. Now, we want to recognize and thank them right at the start. And as I said, the QSO Today podcast and expo is new this year, and Eric Goose, 4Z1UG, is donating something that every workbench has to have, a Hako FX888D soldering station. I have one on my workbench and use it, frankly, almost daily. Thank you for that. MFJ Enterprises, founded by Martin Jew almost 50 years ago on homebrew technology efforts, are donating once again an antenna analyzer. Martin invented the antenna analyzer, and his MFJ 225 HF VHF two port graphic antenna analyzer will surely enhance our hero's workbench to help him or her design antennas and related RF circuits. Siglent Technologies of Solon, Ohio has come on once again. They're donating a four-channel digital oscilloscope, the SDA-1202XE. If you look at Han Summers G0 UPL's uh, YouTube channel for QRP Labs, you'll see how our hero for 2019 did some sophisticated uh, diagnosis with his Siglent oscilloscope to figure out why his uh, power amp chips were blowing in a modification of his QCX rig. And 
you can find out all about Hans' exploits that were helped by the Siglent Technology Digital Oscilloscope. Digilant Incorporated, the National Instruments Company, is also donating once again their amazing and innovative analog discovery to multi-instrument platform. Now, a, a few years ago, I purchased one. It's like a little hockey puck. It has some add-on boards and things that you can get, including an LCR measurement device. There are half a dozen or more instruments that you use with a computer through a USB interface with their free multi-OS platform waveforms. It's an amazing piece of software. So our hero will be receiving analog discovery too. Bob Heil at Heil Sound has been a big supporter of the Homebrew Heroes Award program and for the second time he's donating audio parts for homebrewing so our hero can make some great audio. Bob Heil celebrating over 50 years of excellence in his audio company Heil Sound in the amateur radio market and in the commercial market. Another podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench, and we applaud their efforts to educate uh, the public about homebrew technologies and what's on their workbench and an amazing uh, number of guests. They're donating a companion product called the Bench Duino. It works directly with the Analog Discovery 2. In fact, the AD2 just you know plugs into it. And with that, if you're doing development with an Arduino, or a Raspberry Pi or any of those variants of the Arduino these days, you have a development platform that George KJ6VU and Jeremy KF7IJZ kind of aptly named the Bitch Duino. We thank them for what they do and for their continued sponsorship. Now, I want to also mention that our promotional sponsor is the ICQ podcast. Martin Butler, M1MRB, and Colin Butler, M6BOY, father-son team, over 11 years ago launched what, you know, might have just been a, a few months endeavor. It's now over 11 years and 336 episodes as of this recording. I'm very proud to be one of the presenters that they have on their show at least once a month. So the ICQ podcast Thank you for your support. As media partners of the Homebrew Hero Award, it is an honor to build upon our inaugural winner of the Homebrew Hero Award, Han Summers G0 Uniform Papa Lima. Last year, tens of millions of views across the internet learned to be inspired by Hans and his projects. And more information about the 2019 winner can be found at qrp-labs.com. Response for the amateur radio community has backed the concept of the Homebrew Hero Award, honouring the innovators where no award had previously existed. This year, 2020, COVID-19 has not only changed our hobby, but obviously the world. Many gifted hams have taken the downtime to develop homebrew projects to help and further enhance the amateur radio hobby. With many new projects being developed this year, we are certain that the Homebrew Hero Award will recognize many gifted individuals for years to come. The financial sponsor of the Homebrew Heroes Award program is the foxmikehotel.com website, a companion site to my blog at k4fmh.com. Now, please go to the homebrewheroes.org website and our sponsors page and take a look at these and many other fine products that these sponsors have and see what you need on your workbench. And now, let's go on to our announcement. Hi, I'm Tommy Martin in 5ZNO, one of the hosts of AmateurLogic.tv and Ham College. Frank asked me what I think of George Thomas as a home brewer. Well, to be honest with you, when I think of home brewing, he's the first one that comes to my mind. I've known George for right at 30 years now, and I can't tell you the number of things that I know that he's built. He's built everything from antennas, his own Arduino boards to use in various projects, to 
custom software to do a certain job that just wasn't a piece of software for the task, all the way down to things that I know that he's built for his broadcast engineering daily job. George has shared a lot of these projects with the ham community through the videos on AmateurLogic.tv and Ham Nation. He's inspired a lot of people through those, including myself. I've got a, a pretty well-stocked workbench, thanks to George's encouragement. So what do I think about George as a home brewer? I think he's the first to rate one, and I think the homebrew hero title couldn't have gone to a more deserving person. Congrats, George, my friend. Well, deserved. George Thomas is a longtime home brewer. In fact, the first thing George ever taught me how to home brew was how to use a pair, that is to say, one pair of six by nine speakers on both the built-in AM radio and the under-dash 8-track tape player in my 1965 Mustang. Now, I know that doesn't date me any, but trust me, that was a long time ago. George worked at a franchise Radio Shack store in the 70s, and it had a small electronics repair shop in the rear, and George was the electronics technician. Repairs ran the gamut, everything from, say, hi-fi cassette decks to CB radios. Fast forward 10 years, George's skill set had scaled up dramatically. He was the chief engineer at Miss 103 radio station, and he'd gone from working on hi-fi cassette decks to professional reel-to-reel -reel tape machines, and CB radios to... 100,000 watt FM transmitters. So I think most people have home brewed at one time or another, whether it was because they didn't have the part they needed or it wasn't available. And then there's that other category of folks who have home brewed. People who have home brewed because they enjoy the pleasure of building their own equipment or using gear that they've built. George definitely falls into this category. Um, George has homebrewed everything from complete systems to discrete boxes that hook the systems together. And George uses his homebrew gear that he's built on a, on a daily basis. Um, it would not surprise me to walk over to George's place, walk up and take a look at a project he's working on right now, and see some gear that he homebrewed all the way from back in the 70s, playing an integral role in that project. So when it comes to homebrewers, uh, George is not only one of my favorite homebrewers, He's one of my homebrew heroes. Hello everybody, I'm Bob Heil, K9EID. I'm the host of Ham Nation, a program that's been running on Leo Laporte's network uh, since 2011. My whole idea was that we could bring you how to build things, how to do things, how to put up antennas safely, and all kinds of things on the inside of your ham radio. And um, I, I, I came up with the idea that we could do a segment called Smoke and Solder. Uh, Sarah, the president of Isle Sound, she, uh, she copyrighted that program because we never knew where it was going to go. Well, it went pretty bad right at first because I'm trying to solder, uh, watch the camera, look where the lights are, make sure everything was okay. And oh my goodness, what a mess. About eight weeks into the program, I got a very nice email from George Thomas. Thought that he might be able to help us. And uh, looking through his many years of amateur logic, he was the guy, he was the pro. So George joined, joined us, uh, I think it was the 8th or ninth, ninth or 10th show. He joined us and has been with us ever since on Wednesday night, as well as doing his, night, his weekly uh, amateur logic shows. So he's the real pro, and he's with us every Wednesday night. 
So we congratulate you, George, on the award because you certainly deserve it. You've done so much for ham radio. And I look forward to many years ahead on both Amateur Logic as well as our ham nation. So we'll see you Wednesday night. In the meantime, I, the only advice I have for you is don't give Tommy or any of your other guys, uh, don't give them a blowtorch. They do crazy things with a blowtorch. <laughs> All the Amateur Logic fans will know what I'm talking about. And my personal thing is don't go driving your truck in the mud puddles near the transform a transmitter site because some of those are snake pits. And then you get stuck, and Tommy's going to have to have you drag you out. You know the story. <laughs> we love you, George. You're a great guy. Thanks a lot for being around and teaching us things. We'll see you Wednesday night. Congratulations. Bye-bye for now. Our hero for 2020 actually had a career in radio repair and broadcasting before he made his entrance into amateur radio with Amateur Logic, Episode 1. September 2005. You'll see the faces on the video again as they continued with George through his career to date. We're here in Jackson, Mississippi, in the woods at a Wi-Fi site. Yes, serving a he did have a party going on back there. Burrell, who's but most musicians did. The Beatles year. from Liverpool taught the U.S. that. He continued with Amateur Logic with Tommy and Jim and Peter from Down Under. By episode 39, they'd continued and improved, although somebody must have been told to go take a hike. He began hanging with some well-known hams in the video scene, such as Randy, in 2012, at the National Association of Broadcasters. Some of you may know this guy right here. We, we've seen him around before. Say hello, Julian. Hey, George. How are you doing? It's good to see you. Finally meet. This is the first Finally time we've ever met. You know, I feel like I've known you for a long time. We've, we've chatted a few times on Skype and uh, for the show, but first time in person. So uh, he's my hero. He's absolutely my hero. <laughs> well, he's had uh, a hero status among a number of prominent folks for a while, but he caught the attention of Bob Heil of Ham Nation fame when Bob launched this a new Ham episode Nation. he called... Number six. Recorded June 28, 2011, Smoke and Solder. We want to introduce a new section to the show. This segment is going to, we're going to try to keep this going each week of doing things. I hope this works okay that you guys and gals can see what I'm about to do. And for the podcasters, we're going to, we're going to tell you what's happening. And I have a little printed circuit board. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the camera down here. And let's see what happens when we bring this little puppy down. I think you'll be able to see what's going on. And this is a kit that I got from them. And we're going to make a code oscillator because we have to, we don't have to, but we really should get into a little bit of Morse code. So it's kind of fun to, to build that. And what you have to do is get out the little circuit board that came in the kit. Now I went ahead and I soldered in the battery connector and I soldered in the wires for the key and I soldered the speaker. That took a little more time. I thought, well, we'll do that quick. Here's the meat and potatoes of it. First of all, there's only four parts. There's two resistors and there's the resistor. Now we're going to get into all the and smoke and so solder the became the most popular here. segment on Ham Nation ham, ham radio after Bob launched it. Heavy and but as you can see, but for right it now, was very difficult to do all of that of what the with were, the things be, that Bob green, also brown, did and on Ham Nation. That's 51,000 ohms. 
<laughs> Get out the old soldering iron. Are you ready, Gordo? Here we go, huh? <laughs> All right. And uh, for our listeners, uh, yes, he is holding the soldering iron by the correct end. A good ham has always done it backwards just yes. once and not in a hot tub. Well, so uh, Bob go. realized that he needed some assistance. Transistor Along right came George Thomas, W5JDX. This week on Smoke and Solder, we're going to look at relays, specifically how to drive a high current load with a low current source. Let's take a look at our schematic. I'm using a 2N2405 NPN transistor. Before I connect this circuit to the Arduino, here's our circuit. I've got the ground bus across the back here. So we'll put our current meter there in series with the uh, six volts of battery bulbs. Smoke and solder with George quickly became the most popular segment on Ham Nation. You see that the relay did close. And we've got 2.7 milliamps. 2.5 was our target. When we drop this down to 5 volts, we should be just about where we need to be. So it works. There you've got the lowly little Arduino. Well, Smoke and Solder clicked with the Ham Nation out. audience as well, and it worked very well. Well, that's it. That, that's a lot of fun and useful little circuit, uh, particularly with working with these microcontrollers or TTL level signals where you need to drive a relay to carry a higher current load. This is Ham Nation, episode number 89, March 13th, 2013. George received Dayton's Special Achievement Award. George continued on Ham Nation, and he caught the attention of those people up in Dayton. George Thomas, W5JDX, won the Special Achievement Award at Hamvention for his work on Amateur Logic, but especially Ham Nation. This is Amateur Logic, episode 95 for September 15th, 2016. This is Ham College, episode 4 for April 30th, 2015. Amateur Logic continued to improve, continued to be more professionally produced, but along came Ham College as well. Hi. With his Welcome friend to Tommy Mark, episode of educating Ham hams George. about I'm taking talking. their exam. And it's good to be back with you. We've got a, a, a nice show tonight. We've even got some fruit in here. Yep. Uh, well, I already know we're not going to make fruit salad. What are we going to do with it? No, just pucker up because we've got a, a fun show coming okay. here tonight. We haven't <laughs> tried this yet. Uh, so we're not exactly guaranteed that it's going to work. Okay. Now, this is uh, our, our first attempt at this. I've got three pieces of copper wire here from Romex, and I've got some galvanized nails. These are really long, but it's only galvanized nails that I had. I should have said something. I have a whole bunch of them. Did you? Okay. Yeah, you know, you couldn't really use the bright common nails. They, that's not galvanized. Right. I don't believe it is anyway. But uh, the ones that are kind of dull are, are zinc coated, galvanized. So. We're going to make batteries out of this. Like I say, we haven't tried it yet, so we're just going to have to kind of see how this goes. Well, it, it yeah, it kind of is. I'll split this one with you. You got a knife? <laughs> Actually, I do. All right, so copper and zinc. Which one do you think is going to be the positive lead? I think it's going to be the copper. You think it's going to be the copper? Well, let's find out here. Pretty lucky I think guess, you're right. wasn't it? It was a very lucky guess. Look at there, we've got one, that's a one volt lemon there. You know, I did go to high school too. Yeah. Even though it was in Alabama. Yeah. I guess that Where's counts. Where's the voltage coming from? Is it the acid in the lemon juice? Or is it the copper or well, the zinc? Obviously, it's a combination. It's a chemical reaction between the three. Yeah. The acid and the copper and the zinc. Well, what I read, and I don't have a good way to prove it. The friendship and downbeat humor you might has think been that the signature the for him that's, college. That's where the voltage is coming from. It's actually... And George moved into the anchor chair on Ham Nation periodically. Oh, yeah. Fill yeah. in for Bob. On this episode of Ham Nation, we've got some great information for ham instructors. Plus, Bob shows us how you can build a simple phased array for your HF station. Don has news of the tornado that recently hit the Hara Arena. 
And Dale's got some great dating videos. This is Amateur Logic, episode 144 for June 15th, 2020. So here is my latest incarnation of Tap That Squelch. And <laughs> I, I, this one is working great. Oh, we'll talk more you about might it. Remember after. in last month's show, I showed you how to tap that squelch. We were using an old Radio Shack HTX 212 rig with Echo Link and needed a way to get a squelch signal out of it. George is a great I teacher, and his style of using practical devices and modifications helped him understand the basics of the rigs that they have. Inverter, two this particular rig for Echo Link, I suspect, is okay, currently in service in the Jackson the metropolitan area. signal is not the same as a TTL level signal. It seemed like it was going to work. Well, I've got the temperature sensor, too. What, what could we do with it? Let's see. Giving a talk to a local club, right there. he continues his humor with a dramatic demonstration. <laughs> Channeling his inner Jerry Lee Lewis, 75 JDX sets his rig on fire. Uh, At least that's what this Arduino says. Maybe I got somebody enthused enough to to look at these little Arduinos. You can do all kinds of stuff. It's just a matter of how much time you want to put in it. All the resources are out there on the internet to learn this. All the, the heavy lifting's been done. You just search around till you find what it is you want to do and put all those pieces together and you can set your radio on fire too. George is a hero to many in the homebrew and amateur radio world and he's certainly our hero for 2020. Well hi guys, this year's come around yet again. I'm about to announce this year's homebrew hero for 2020 and it's been a great year for Hans Summers in 2019, but this year we have Mr. George Thomas, W5JDX. Hi, George. Uh, hi, Martin. Let me say what an honor it is to to be here with you today, and uh, and thanks so much for the recognition and the award there. I was not expecting this at all. It just came out of the blue. Well, for, well, George. In fairness. I don't get to choose uh, because Frank won't let me on the uh, on on the steering committee that does the choosing. But uh, in fairness, in fairness, they always seem to do a very very good job. And uh, as I say, you've been very very active in your amateur career. I know that uh, most people will know you from um, Amateur Logic TV, which uh, you've been doing for over fifteen years. You also do uh, Ham College TV, and dare I say it, you help out on Ham Nation, which is uh, also began, must be 10 years Ham Nation, isn't it? I think we're right around 10 years, yeah, it's uh, it's been going a while, and it has really been a privilege to, to work with Bob Heil and Gordon West and everyone else on that show. Yeah. Yeah, well, as I say, it's great. You, I mean, you're weekly on the Ham Nation. We're fortnightly. But uh, so most people only know you from that, George. But I know you've done a lot in your life as well. You've, you're a broadcast engineer. You're a software developer, podcast producer like ourselves. Um, but tell us, tell us what got you into the hobby in the first place, George? Well, actually, I, I grew up in a very small town, and there were no hams anywhere around there. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, there was a small uh, junior college town. Uh, during the, the year when school was going, we, my population was maybe like 1,000. When school was out, it dropped to about 500. So I didn't know anybody else who knew anything about radio that experimented with electronics or anything like that. And 
But they were just my interest for some reason, and I bought the popular electronics magazines and went through them as a kid and looked at the things they had in there and uh, just kind of experimented with basic stuff like switches and speakers and, you know, tying things together. And I ran across an article one time in one of those magazines about building a transmitter that you could connect to a fence and talk for a number of miles. And it required a ham radio license. That may have been the first time I'd heard of amateur radio. And I, I was interested, but I just didn't know anybody else who was doing it. Uh, so I really didn't have any Elmers. And I eventually bought a copy of the ARRL handbook. I don't remember what year that was. Probably, I don't know, sometime in the 70s. But I had a general interest in radio, and in 72, while I was still in high school, I got a job at a, a radio station a couple of towns over, and we had to take our third-class uh, radio telephone license exam. It basically rules and regulations, that type of thing. And I didn't really want to be a disc jockey so much as I wanted to do the technical stuff. But, you know, being a disc jockey was about the only job they had for a 16-year-old, so I took it. And so yeah. I, I did that for about five years and while I was going to school and, and got out. And I never, this was, this was 72 I got licensed with a commercial ticket. I did not become a ham until 1991 when... Finally, someone mentioned to me, uh, well, a good friend of mine, Jim, N5SPE, who we started Amateur Logic with. Yeah. Uh, he said they, they've just dropped the Morse code requirement for the technician exam, and I'm coming down there this weekend, and we're going to go take our test. And I said, okay, and it's it's been quite a fun trip ever since. I've been active the whole time since 91. And I wish I would have done it years ago. I just, I didn't know anybody doing it. A friend of mine one point gave me a Smith Code Course record. He couldn't right. find the book that went with it. So I didn't learn the code. And that's that's pretty what, much what kept me out because the electronics and all I really had a big interest in and have played with you know, most of my life, so. Yeah. But that's kind of where I got into ham radio. I'd already worked in radio and television for a number of years, and still there was more to learn. I had a couple of great Elmers uh, in, uh, well, in broadcasting, but when I got to ham radio, I met these other guys that knew a lot about it, and they were very helpful in getting me started because, you know, there's some things that hams do that um, the commercial broadcasters really don't do. You know, in, in ham radio, we're building so much stuff and and trying to do things as cheaply as we can that these tips from these um, guys who had been hams for a while were really a big help to me. Certainly, certainly is. Uh, I spent... Um didn't quite go the same route as you. I probably should have been licensed around about 76. Uh, went to night school to do this. The, uh, the the instructor wasn't particularly interested, and I lost interest. And it wasn't till around about 99 that uh, I was um, sitting doing a contract job, and one of the other contractors said, "Oh, you need a hobby." I went, oh yeah, he said. Uh, how about ham radio? I said, oh, yeah, I, but I'm not all that. And he went, I would sit down, and I'd done, um, I'd been a radio and TV engineer earlier on, and we actually just did the, uh, sat there for the for lunchtime, and he said at the end of it, he said, oh, why don't you just take the test? He said, you only need to learn the, the um, you only need to learn the regulations. But I went away, and I actually uh, enjoyed it myself. And I, I think, 
One of the biggest things I've got from amateur radio, and hopefully you have as well, is the comradeship. The, yes. The, 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 there seem to be genuine people in amateur radio. You know, we work together, we help each other, and there's a lot of good vibes, I would suggest. Yeah, the, the radio station I work for, the owner of that station, actually was a ham. And he had told me I, I need to look into it, but I, I didn't. You know, I was a teenager, and I was working at night at the radio station. I played drums, too, and did a little of that. And then, you know, you had to chase girls a little bit. I just didn't leave any time to sit down and hit the books for ham radio. But yeah. he... He had told me, doesn't matter where you go in the world, if if you're a ham, you're going to have a friend there. And that's too true. right, too mm-hmm. right. And I think we all we all, we all find discover girls, and that puts a, a large part of our life life on hold for a while. But I've said to lots of people and and the youngsters, it doesn't matter. Once you've got your license, you're in the hobby for life. As long as you you know just renew it. You might not actually do anything for a while, but you're in. Uh, so yeah. um, that's good. And then I suppose in the broadcast industry and uh, a lot of the things you do now in your private life are all about building things, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they are. You know, and typically in the broadcast industry, you're maintaining equipment that was commercially purchased. But there are some things you need that are just not available. You've got a specific situation you're trying to solve, and sometimes you have to build this device or whatever you need on your own so you can customize it and and make it do what's needed there. Now, that's not done as much these days as it was back in uh, the earlier days in broadcasting because there's so many products out there, and I don't think the knowledge runs as deep today with the people who are coming into that but you know back earlier they had to do all that stuff because the gear didn't exist and i i really enjoy that a lot i've done it most of my life now a lot of what i do is not necessarily building something from scratch as much as it is taking one or more things that are already built assembling them together making some modifications to where it works the way that that i want it to and i i have as much fun doing that as i do building stuff yeah well that's systems that's system building isn't it so instead of building a small device you're building systems which is equally uh, a skill and it's, you know you 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 end up with a product as you say that does what you require it to do it is and one of my favorite things for the last few years here, it's not the only thing I do, but I, a lot of it, these little microcontrollers have gotten so inexpensive. You know, it's basically just a chip, and it's a whole computer on a chip, and um, you program it to do the task you want. You, you've you got TTL inputs and outputs on it, so you can connect it to other stuff. I have thoroughly enjoyed playing with the Arduinos. Uh, I played with the basic stamps when they came out. I play with the Raspberry Pis some too. I probably kind of lean in the direction of the Arduinos. And I try to encourage people all the time, you really need to take a look at that because you can build these complex systems with, you know, this little $5 chip. Or you can already buy it assembled on a board for, you know, $30 or less. Um, some of them as low as, you know, 5 or $10. And things that you would have set down and drawn out the PC board for and added all these discrete components, you can build in this little microcontroller uh, with just a little bit of code. And you don't have to buy all those parts and assemble them. You just program the device to do it, and programming is not as hard as you would think. You know, in so many cases, what you want to do, or excuse me, what you want to do, someone has already done, or something similar to it, 
and they share the code. You can just go download it, upload it to the device, and it works. After you've done that a few times and analyzed the code, maybe looked up some terms on the Internet, you can kind of understand what it is, and you might go in and just make a few changes on it and customize it for your exact use. And it's uh, it took a lot less physical building, probably cost less than you would have spent on discrete components. And you've learned a little more about that type of thing. So that's one of my big fun things to do. I'm self-taught as a programmer, and uh, I actually own uh, uh, part of a software company that makes automation systems for radio stations. Uh, Tommy, N5ZNO, my partner on Amateur Logic, and another ham, one of my Elmers I was telling you about, Bob, uh, who was N5RMZ, he he let his license lap, so he's not uh, a ham now. But we started a company and wrote the software and started the, a company to do that. And, you know, I did that for almost 20 years exclusively. Yeah. And, and then I just got back into doing radio engineering here in the last uh, four or five years. I had laid that to the side. I I had gotten enough of it, but finally, uh, um, well, a group of stations here in town needed an engineer, and they couldn't find one. They made me an attractive offer, and I had been out of it so long that I was no longer burnt out. I was ready to get back into it. That's good. That's yeah. good. Um, I, I, I almost got into broadcast engineering once myself, uh, radio station in London uh, didn't quite get the job but I got down to the last few and I hadn't I was going against people who had experience but what do you say about to Arduinos I've certainly played with the Arduinos and got a few little projects on the go and the, the, they're very they're, they're aiming us in the right direction because we are moving far more into a software defined radio world uh, where you're going to have to program things. And the Arduino is just such a, a nice device to learn. And as you say, there are varying in prices depending on where you buy them from. But because the hardware is open source, there are no pirate copies of an Arduino. Right. Because yeah. they're, they're, pirates, they're open source. Anybody can manufacture them. So you can sometimes buy them for absolutely stupid money, and you don't you, you don't even have to buy a power supply. You can plug it into um, you know a USB lead will plug it in, and once you've written your code, there's no operating system. You know you, you just plug it in, and it does what it says on the tin or what your program has, wants you to do. So. I agree, George. I've got one or two little devices I'm quite pleased with that work very well. And I'm not the best programmer in the world, but uh, that's, I think, the way we're going rather than, you know, sitting there soldering lots of components together. Yeah, and I feel fortunate to have had that experience of soldering the components together and and working at that level because that's all we did, you know, before uh, these type of things came along. And so... You can tie those two together. You can use the Arduino and tie your discrete components to build a very complex system. But so much of it, you can just have in that one little chip. And yeah. as you say, you just uh, upload the code into it or download it, whichever way you want to call it. And it's it's not really an operating system, so it's not going to crash like your Windows PC. It's just going yeah. to run, purpose-built, and that's all it knows is what you told it to do. So very, very robust. Yeah, and if it does crash, it's your own fault because you wrote the program. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, so, but no, no, all jesting aside. So now you've got a year where you're going to be our homebrew hero uh, for, the, for the next year. Have you got anything planned? Does, has this sparked any interest for you? Well, it's, uh, and by the way, I'll just show this. I know Frank 
would like me to uh-huh. show this and uh, if I can get it. Yeah, yeah. It's not glared too much. This is my homebrew oh, hero plaque I'll be displaying and and polishing off and uh trying to live up to it. I you know, as far as what I'm gonna build, I don't start out with too many concrete ideas. They just hit me as they come along and I might be surfing the web and, and run across something and that sparks an idea. Or I might run across a problem that I need to solve and that sparks an idea. Currently and I meant to have it back here but I I don't. It's on the uh other side of the office here. I've been working with a little ESP eighty two sixty six module. It's uh you program it with the Arduino language and it's a little microcontroller. It's not the same one that they use in the Arduino, but yeah. they have written the drivers and all for it, so it just works like, you know, uh, the operating or, or the uh, programming environment doesn't really know that it's not an Arduino. They use basically the same commands. A few things are slightly different. It's just a little tiny module that has Wi-Fi built in it, and you can buy these things for under $10 a piece. So I've got one of those, and I've been working with it, and I bought a uh, an eight relay interface board. It's just a you know cheap uh, Chinese board that has eight single pole double throw relays on it. It's about yeah oh you know maybe that big. That itself was probably around ten bucks, and so I've connected them together and. Uh, I can take my phone or a web browser or whatever, and I can log in to that little module, and it will send me back a web page with an interface with the eight relays, and I can turn on or off things remotely using my phone or whatever. And here I've done this for less than 20 bucks, And to have something that gives you that kind of control, say, five or ten years ago would have cost a substantial amount more. I mean, to do stuff like that at the broadcast stations, remote controls, you know, we'd pay a thousand dollars or more for something that does basically what I've done here for twenty dollars. Here's the completed project. Well, almost completed. It's down to the software now and it's I, I just keep adding things to it, but there's the eight channel relay board right there. You know, that costs ten bucks. Just uh you know, you can find those all over the internet. Here yeah. is the ESP eighty two sixty six, the little microcontroller yeah. with the, the Wi Fi built on it. You can see that little silver can right there. That's the Wi Fi yeah. device. Yeah. There's the antenna. It's mounted crooked because well, where the mounting holes were, that's the only way I could get it. I've got a piece of uh, ribbon here, a uh, multicolored ribbon cable. Yeah, I like to yeah. use that because then you can, it's much easier to trace through and make sure you've got things going in the right position. But that's oh, yes. all, all there is to it, and it's complete. I put me a power jack on it here uh, so I yeah. can you know run in voltage and... Uh, the thing is working. I'm just still tweaking on the code a little bit. And I'm going to make that code available as, as soon as I'm ready to publish it. Uh, hopefully it won't be very long because I've been working on this for several months now. I just keep adding things to it. But uh, you'll be able to download the code and do your own A-channel relay board there, Wi-Fi controlled. You'll need to change the the password, of course, and the SSID for your network. A couple of little things like that, but those are going to be pretty simple to do. I'm going to make that as simple as possible. Or you may want to go in and change something else about it. So uh, it'll be out there. It could be used as is with just entering your credentials. Or take it apart and do whatever you want to with it. That's most of the, the things like this I do, I I share the source code and uh, because uh, a lot of the, the things I build is source code I downloaded yeah. from someone else that they put in the public domain and just modify it around. No reason to reinvent the wheel. 
So very true, very true. But from what you're saying, for around about $20, you've almost got a home automation system there. Uh, but even better than that, how about a shack automation system? You know, being able to switch the rig on before you get in the shack and the lights and the bits and pieces. So uh, as you're making your way to the shack, you're setting everything up. And in that's, your operator. that's one thing yeah. I, I have in mind for this. You know, in, MFJ makes a uh, an eight-port antenna switch. It, it's got yeah. eight PL259s, or actually SO239s for your antennas, and then, um, you know, one common one to connect your rig to. I And they have a control box with push buttons on it, and I think maybe you can control it uh, with a serial port. I want to just just get the relay part of that connected up with this, and then I've got a Wi-Fi controlled antenna switch. So uh, that would be perfect for when you're remoting into your rig and you need to change antennas. Well, you just do it over Wi-Fi right there, and then uh, that's always kind of seemed to be a limiting factor to me on remoting is Okay, you connect to the rig and you can control it over the internet and get your audio back and forth. But what about switching antennas? And this just seems like um, a project waiting to happen. It certainly does because, uh, yeah, all right, some rigs you can have two antennas, but uh, if you've got eight antennas sw switch, that gives you a lot more, lot more uh, flexibility. And uh, as I said I think uh, this is the way things are going. Software-defined radios now seem to be the way everybody's going. And software control. We need to be able to do these things in software. And, you know, as you've said, one of those little boards uh, can do a hell of a lot more than discrete components. If you did it in discrete components, you'd have a massive uh, thing about probably 10 times the size of that to do what that little board does. Oh, yeah, if if not larger than that. And, you know, you're going to have to burn a PC board, and once you've done that and got all your components soldered down, if you want to make a change to it, hmm, that could be difficult. But with these, you know, you just go in and change a couple of lines or parameters in some of the source code and upload it again and... And you're ready to go there. So, yeah, I'll I'll agree. I think this is the way things are shifting. But working with discrete components is still fun. And I just did, well, in the last episode of Amateur Logic, I pulled out some old 22, or excuse me, 2N2222 transistors and just did three little projects with those and just a few components on the show just to show that, hey, you can do this stuff too and, you know, here's some some uh, basic circuits you can build, thanks to Forrest Mims and his engineer's many notebooks. I've always been a big believer in the Forrest Mims books. So, yeah. you know, it's it's there. Why not use it? Yeah. Well, I think that that's the fun fun of what we do, amateur, hub, amateur radio. The building side of it is one part of it, and... Uh, I say, obviously, you enjoy that that side. I must admit, I do as well. And the, it's the way things are going. And now, if somebody wants to be a, an appliance operator, they still can in this hobby. But I don't know. This hobby is big enough for us to all enjoy it, I would say. Yeah, you're exactly right. There are so many different facets to the hobby. Some people like to contest. I I don't really do much contesting. I'll do field day. Um, you know, some people like to just get on and rag chew. Some people like to do CW or digital modes. Uh, some people like to build. I like a little bit of all those things, but not a whole lot of anyone in particular, except the building and experimenting. I really like that. And I will like field day. We'll go out and uh, and do field day out in the woods here. Uh, you know, a couple of our, our friends here, Tommy, my partner on Amateur Logic, and uh, our good friend Wayne, KG5RE, just about every year. We didn't this year now, and we haven't when it's rained out, but we'll go out in the woods, pitch a tent, and completely off the grid, set up our antennas, and 
and do field day for the weekend. And we spend more time setting all that up and adjusting it and trying it out than we actually do making contacts. And it's still just a lot of fun. That's what it's all about. If it isn't fun, we wouldn't do it. Uh, so I do go out uh, with the club contesting uh, for our SSB field day. But uh, outside of that, I really don't do that many contests. Occasionally, I'll give a few points away, but uh, so I'm not a contester uh, per se. But um, going uh, forward, George, I think it would be nice to uh, get you back onto the ICQ podcast in the near future. So once you've uh, settled in as the homebrew hero of 2020, you're going to hold that title around till late 21. So, uh, you know, it, it's nice. You've got your nice plaque, nice shirts, mm-hmm. and uh, be nice to see what you've been up to later on because uh, that'll be that'll be a good one, George, I would suggest. Well, yeah, and I would like to join y'all and catch up on things. And as well, I'd I'd like to have you join us on Amateur Logic or Ham Nation sometime soon. I got to tell you, uh, those are mighty big shoes to fill there, uh, to wear this shirt right here and follow behind Hans is going to be a tough act to follow. But I'm going to do my best. It'll probably be a little different flavor uh, because just whatever I'm doing is is whatever we'll show and uh, and share with people. And, you know, next year, next uh, Homebrew Hero may have a completely different take on it as well. So we'll just have to see. I don't have any concrete plans, but that's never stopped me before. Well, that's fine. And uh, as I say, um, next year's homebrew hero, whoever they are, and I say they because it could be a lady next year for all I know. Uh, I'm not actually on the steering committee that uh, chooses, but uh, I enjoy actually doing the announcement. Frank lets me do the announcement, which is good. But uh, I say that's all good. Now, George, if somebody would like to talk, get hold of you, to talk to you, What's the best way of contacting you? Well, email. I don't hide my email address, and it's pretty easy to figure out. I'm George at AmateurLogic.tv. So uh, just drop me an email if you got a question. Or if you'd like to share one of your projects with me, you know, let me know what you're building. Send me some photos. I'm always real interested to see what other people are doing because there's a lot of stuff going on out there that we don't hear about and always great uh, you know kind of get a feel for for what other people have got going on yeah yeah now i'm sure that your colleagues on amateur logic and tam nation are gonna rib you about being a homebrew hero i think they're gonna be somewhat jealous I know they won't mean it nastily. I, I would say that uh, they're going to be pleased for you, but are you expecting a little bit of ribbon? I'm expecting a fair amount of ribbon. I'll have to be honest, Martin. Um, yeah, you know, a couple of our guys like to do photoshopping of photos, so I expect to to see some pictures of me wearing a cape or, or no telling what. Uh, they usually uh, surprise me with those type of things. And so you'll never see it coming until it's there. But, yeah, I, I suspect there'll be a little ribbon involved, but uh, that's okay. And I I do want to say that I couldn't do the things I do without the support of, you know, all the other people who do it too. It's, you know, we're all just out there trying to have a good time and share what we're doing, you know. Get more people interested. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. Uh, as I say, like yourself, we uh, we do it for the enjoyment of the hobby. And uh, one day, if I can find it, I'll send you the uh, rules that Colin published once for ICQ presenters. And it's something like uh, it mentions the number of coffees I have. <laughs> and I'm not allowed to be a let loose on my own because I commit to things. <laughs> but uh, 
Uh, if I can find it, I'll send you. It's quite a giggle. It's all done tongue in cheek, but uh, yeah, you have to. I mean, if you if you give it, if you enjoy the banter, you give the banter. You have to be able to take it, and uh, I think as long as it's done in good faith, nobody minds. But uh, there you go. So, George, any last things you'd like to tell us before we wind this up? Um, you know, the biggest thing I like to tell people is. To, to get started, you know, the, the project that is most likely to be successfully completed is the one that you actually started. If you're sitting over there with a box full of parts and ideas, but you never do anything, you'll never finish it. So I like to tell people, get out there and get your hands dirty. Do a little bit of soldering. Maybe you don't solder so well. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And just just get started experimenting, you know. That's a big part of the hobby for me. I know it's not everybody's thing, but, you know, if you've got any interest at all, you you should be trying some things. It's never too late to get started with that. And, again, thanks for this award. It's uh, it's going to be tough to to wear the cape and, and keep up with it. But, uh, you know, I'm going to do my best this year. And... Like I say, no concrete ideas on projects I'm going to do yet, but that's not the way I work. They'll just come about, and uh, when it strikes the fancy, we'll put it out there. and We'll look at the end of the year and see what we came up with. That'll be good. Well, we'll catch up with you throughout the year, and uh, let's say that all sounds good. Well, I'd like to thank you uh, very much, George, for giving us your time. And it's been my pleasure to make the announcement of on the Homebrew Heroes. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'll say 73. All right. Thank you, Martin, and everyone affiliated with Homebrew Heroes and the ICQ podcast. 73. 73, George. Testing one, two, three. I'm checking the audio this damn time to make sure that it works.